Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to today's uh, program. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Yu Feng Liang. Liang, yeah. Uh, Yu Feng got his uh, bachelor's uh, of degree in physics from University of Science and Technology in China. Uh, by the way, three of our faculty members in the department of the school. One more. With the first time being me now being able to qualify for that pretty, pretty good school. And, <laughs> and then uh, he went to Washington University in St. Louis uh, and got his PhD in physics in 2014. After that, he joined the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as a postdoc uh, 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 since 2014. And today, uh, he will talk about the first principles of many body series from perturbative to non perturbative regime. Uh, please uh, allow me to welcome Dr. Liang. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here in the University of Kansas Department of Physics. So today, I'm going to talk about um, first principle many body theory. So let me just begin by explaining the title. First principle, or ab initial theory. What does that mean? It means from the beginning. It means we, we derive nature from the most fundamental laws of nature. In condensed metaphysics, this means we use a quantum mechanic to make prediction about realistic materials across different dimensions, including bulk crystal, just like the crystal we can borrow from a Swarovski's store, um, down to two-dimensional materials about the thickness of one atom, and 1D materials such as nano wires or nano tubes, and all the way down to molecules which contains only a few number of atoms. The, the properties we can produce with a high accuracy nowadays include the structural property, like the coordinate of the ions in the materials, and conductivity, such as the thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, photoabsorption, how strong the material absorbs sunlight, absorb light at a particular frequency, magnetism, and so forth. One question you may ask, these properties, the experimentalists, they can measure easily in the lab. Well, not necessarily easily. They can measure that, <laughs> yeah, in the lab. <laughs> Why do we bother to calculate them? Well, for one thing, computer, algorithm, theory, are so advanced nowadays, we don't have to do the laborious, intense experiment to make materials to prediction. We can do that on computer and do faster screening. Secondly, that's the mindset of the physics. We are not just satisfied by seeing just the phenomena. We're also interested in the microscopic insight. For the materials of property I just talked about, there's a microscopic picture behind, called the many-body excitation, in which there are multiple particles participating in the excitation, such as the aceton, the pairing of the electron and hold, is responsible for optical absorption. Plasma is responsible for electrical magnetism, magnetical shooting near the metal surface. Cooper pair, the pairing of a two electron mediated by a distorted lattice, responsible for superconductivity. Maglon, the uh, a wave of the spin, which is responsible for a long range of robust magnetism you can see on the macroscopic um, level. Now, the key is to solve the Schrodinger equation. Solve that for one electron is easy, but solve that for 10 to the 23 electron in a solid state system is a daunting task. Even Mr. Feynman is astonished by the complexity of, the, of this problem. David Hilbert, who invented Hilbert space, also says physics is already too complicated for physics. So that actually creates lots of jobs for mathematicians. And today, we're using supercomputer to tackle this kind of problem. So here's, the, here's, here's our whole family of quantum manipulative theory, or you may say method or algorithm. On one end, we have the very rigorous method such as the full config configuration interaction, exact diagonalization, which should take into account some strong electron electron interaction. So this method are basically brute force calculation of the many body system using using the true many body wave function. Other methods such as the, the DMRG, density matrix renormalization group, and quantum Monte Carlo, make smart approximation to the many body wave function. But even still, 
this computational method is just too rigorous to extend to larger system. In the parallel universe, quantum chemistry, they're, studying, they're also studying wave function method for realistic molecules. But because the interaction taken into account is still too complicated, it's too hard to extend to solid state system. Oops, sorry. In the other extreme, we have density functional theory, many body perturbation theory. This theory assumes electron electron interaction is weak. And actually, we find out that's almost the case for many, many solids. And this theory either works with density or with a Feynman diagram. And turns out we can use that, use this theory to predict larger system, extended system, like solid and liquid. And we can also use this theory to predict not just the ground state, but also the excited state. So in today's talk, I'm going to focus on this good scaling theory for larger system. I'll be talking about some advancement I made in this field, in many body perturbation theory, and how to push forward the frontier of this theory to that side. Okay? Here's the outline. First, I'll talk about um, many body perturbation theory, which is based on Feynman diagram. I'm going to use that to study two dimensional materials. Especially, I'm going to study the excited state, such as the band gap and aceton. It was believed Feynman diagram so far is the best method to predict the excited state in a solid state system. However, in the second part of the talk, I will give you one counter example. I will be using a many body wave function method. It turns out this method can capture more physics and in a more efficient manner for X-ray spectroscopy. So let's kick off with the first session, two-dimensional materials. I assume most of you have heard about some of these materials. So basically, they are just one atom thick sheet of materials. Here's are some example, like graphene. You may have also heard about many of times in all kinds of commercial websites and physics websites. And bond nitride, molar layer MOS2, molar layer phos uh, phosphorin is molar layer phosph phosphorus. These two D materials has one or more of these property. They may be mechanically strong, has a very good electrical or thermal conductivity. They may also absorb sun uh, light pretty strongly. Here are two representative example. Graphene. Near the Fermi level, the band structure display a direct cone um, dispersion relation, which means the fermions or the carriers in this system is massless. This leads to a very high electron mobility in the system. That's 100 times larger than the mobility in silicon. The second example, molar layer molybdenum disulfide. This is the optical spectrum. You can see it absorbed sunlight at the visible light region, about 10% and, and even 15%. Because of these this extraordinary properties, <coughs> people are considering 2D materials as potential transistor photovoltaics and thermal electric and other applications. And of the center of this application is the electronic and optical properties. That's something I would use many body perturbation theory to predict with a high accuracy. So here's the basic idea of the perturbation theory. It's not too different from a Taylor expansion. Let's say you have something difficult, like side of x, that's difficult to calculate. In order to approximate this guy, you can pick somewhere a point that's easy to calculate, like zero. Then you add terms that are less, e less difficult to calculate. That's the basic idea of the perturbation theory. In a many-body system, we can also divide the Hamiltonian into two parts. Non interacting, which is easy to solve, interacting, which is much harder to solve. For the ground state, for the, for the H0, for the non interacting part, we can start with a well established theory called the DFT, density functional theory. Basically, I assume all the particles are non interacting. They only interact with one thing the charge density of the entire system. And the effective potential is described by the hard trip potential, it's just like a mean field, and also the exchange correlation potential. That describes some degree of electron-electron interaction. Now, in the so-called local density approximation, Karn and Sham make a very brave assumption about the, this potential. It assumes the exchange correlation potential at R only depends on the charge density at R, 
which means the interaction here only depends on the charge density locally, not the electron density elsewhere. When they put back the, ex extend, uh, the, the potential back into the Schrodinger equation, add that back to the Schrodinger equation, we can solve this so-called quantum orbital, and then the charge density in a self-consistent manner. DFT turns out so successful that um, it actually uh, leads to more than 48,000 citation. It is very good at, uh, for predicting ground state energy, ground state density, and hence the structural property means the actual crystal structure. Did, did I block something? Is okay? Okay. The actual ionic position. And also give to, to a whole bunch of uh, scientific software for materials research. You may have heard about some of them, like Quantum Expresso and WASP. Those are the two mainstream. Because of this great achievement, Walter Kahn was awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 98. OK, now a question you may, you may ask. The quantum equation is just like a Schrodinger equation. In principle, you can solve many, many bands all the way to the top. And why don't you use this theory to predict exciting state we were talking about? Here's one example. That's a band structure of silicon. I assume you already know about what a band structure is. So it's divided into a valence band and the uh, conduction band. And we are interested in the gap between the two, between the occupied and the unoccupied manifold. Because that defines whether the system is a, an insulator or a metal. If we were to use a quantum equation to calculate the band gap, we get systematical underestimation. For example, in silicon, the band gap is just one half compared to experiment. For germanium, the DFT prediction is a metal, while in reality, the experimental value indicates it is a semiconductor. This is a little big problem because we have totally wrong idea about the electrical property of the materials. Here's a, a one simple explanation for why DFT cannot capture excited state. In DFT, let's say we have any electron. Before the excitation, this any electron just got occupying the, the valence band. However, when we talk about band gap, it's a, about a transport property. One electron propagating in a solid like that. So we're actually talking about an N plus one electron system. Furthermore, when you travel in the solid, because of quantum interaction between, among, between this electron and the other electron, this electron will begin to move and to screen the electric field of that electron. So eventually, we have a many body wave function like this. Not just the first configuration, but many, many other configuration testing to account the electron screening process. In the so-called Fermi liquid theory, um, it assumes electron-electron interaction is weak. So from the basic idea of a pervasion theory, we can think this configuration will have a particular strong weight, like 70% or 90%, while the rest 10% or 20% will take into account the screening process. Now this is remarkable because we can use the idea of one particle to describe such a many-body system. One particle travel in a solid, surrounded by those electronic screening. The real complexity of the problem lies in here. How do you take into account the electron screening process? There are so many possibilities for creating electron and hole. And that's something we steal from high energy physics, quantum field theory. Feynman diagram. That's the Feynman diagram takes into account the bounding of an electron and positron. There is a perfect duality between this process and the electron hole pairing in a solid state phases. Electron correspond to the n plus one configuration system, and the positron correspond to the n minus one electron system, which means a hole. Okay. So now this is an, I'm not just artist drawing of the physics process. It's not just drawing. It's not just a schematic. Each of this line, like this solid line, they were and in the wiggle line, it represents a chunk of the mathematics. Like the solid line, it represents the Green's function, and the wiggle line it represents the quantum interaction. And you may consider that as some sort of effect of particles. When we combine all of this math, we can actually calculate the transition amplitude for this process, and also many of the physical observable, 
such as the uh, band gap and the band energy, stuff like that. So this is the Feynman diagram that takes into account the uh, quasi-particle. Basically, it's just the equation of motion for quasi-particle. One electron runs into a crowd of electrons. And this is sigma. It's called self-energy. That takes into account the screening process. There's a whole crowd of electrons in here. This equation is figured out by Dyson. There's a Dyson equation for quasi-particle. And in 65, Hindi figured out a very simple approximation to this process called a GW approximation. Basically, it assumes this is self-energy. It's a product of the so-called screen quantum interaction called W. And G, the Green's function for a single particle. And W, he assumed there's a, such a simple form. It's a series of diagrams. Each diagram contains a string of bubbles. What does that mean? Each bubble means the generation of an electron and a hole. We call that P. When the electron hole recombine, it can actually produce another electron and a hole. And this process can go on and on and on and on, and this many, many high order process. And that's the tool we use to tackle electronic screening in, in solid. Now, this formalism, this GW approximation, which sounds completely abstract to you and has nothing to do with real materials. In 86, Hyberson and Louis make a breakthrough. The idea is that they use the orbital obtained, the quantum orbital obtained from DFT, to calculate the quantity we need in GW approximation, such as G, prizability, W, sigma, and so forth. This theory turns out to be very successful in predicting the band gap of semiconductor. In here, you can see the band gap predicted by GW. It's almost, it's quite, it's quite close to the experimental value. The error is just a 0.1 EV. This is remarkable. GW approximation has now become a standard tool for studying the band structure, excited state property in solid. What about two-dimensional materials? Less is low about two-dimensional materials because they are new. So here's a study I, I performed to, to, uh, to study a molybdenum sulfide. And this class of material called the monolayer metal dichalogenite. They are important because they can absorb sunlight strongly, and people are interested in learning about their basic electronic structure. And that's the band, band, band energy I calculated. The solid line I given by DFT, while the gray region I given by GW. One thing I find out is the GW correction over the LDA, over the DFT value is huge. The correction is 1 AV. The reason is that in a two-dimensional situation, it is embedded in a vacuum. There's nothing nearby. So actually, some column line has ran into the, into the vacuum. So we have a, only have partial screening in a 2D material, not like a full screening in solid. So this actually enhances the electron electron direction and then leads to a larger GW approximation. Now, this is just the case for intrinsic system. It may be a bit boring. However, when people want to modify the property of this material, they introduce doping. Now, doping is like a, is a, a common technique to modify the property of semiconductor. People are using that all the time in, in, in semiconductor industry. A question that was unclear when 2D material came out is that how is the doping effect on the band structure of two-dimensional material? That's the problem I'm considering. If I dope the 2D materials, when the Fermi level rays into the conduction band, how does this change the band gap? I hope you can appreciate this problem is, is very different from a bulk situation. In bulk, the density stage is a scale, like the square root of E. However, in a two-dimensional case, the density stage is like a step function, a sudden increase of the, uh, of the density state. And from conventional wisdom, we know that the strength of the screening is basically proportional to the density state near the Fermi level, because that can offer more transition channel. Does that imply we have a sudden increase of the screening and sudden decrease in the electron-electron coupling, and hence a sudden change, sudden shrinkage of the band gap? 
Now, this is counterintuitive, because from the idea of a physics, things should be changed continuously. For example, at light doping, you would expect the band gap change continuously, not abruptly. So we are actually run into a paradoxical situation. In order to solve that problem, I use first principle calculation to investigate the screen current interaction. So basically, that's the equivalent of uh, looking at the directory function, okay? The microscopic directory function, which is a function of the spatial quantity you can think about as wave length, and also a function of frequency, okay? I use first principle calculation to calculate that guy. And that is a static uh, screening picture. For the intrinsic semiconductor, when I do the calculation, I find the dielectric function just goes to one in a long range limit because the 2D semiconductor just behaves like a vacuum. If you look at that pretty far away from a macroscopic uh, uh, level, it just behaves like a, like a vacuum. So the dielectric function is just one. However, in the dope semiconductor, we now have an intra-band transition. The transition can happen over a band, and those wave functions look similar. So this is suddenly <coughs> increasing the, the screening, and this constant goes to zero. OK, so when we look at the static dielectric function, this also seems to imply the screening will have a sudden <coughs> change. However, one thing we cannot forget is dynamical effect. What I'm plotting here is the dielectric function on the frequency domain. The sharp peak here <coughs> is the represent the plasma resonance, the movement of a, a number of electrons in a coherent, in a correlated way. Now, in a 2D case, the plasma behaves very differently compared to a ball situation. Because the plasma gets softened, the coulomb restoring force is not as strong as in a ball case. In a ball case, you can imagine this <coughs> charge just vibrate like this. It's just like walls of a charge. They can hold each other pretty strongly. However, when you compress that to a 2D plane, you have to think about the charge density fluctuation. The restoring force is as lot as strong as compared to a 3D case. So as a result, in the long range, the plasma frequency goes to zero because of the softening of the electron vibration. So now this is important. What does a plasma mean? Above the plasma frequency, the electron ceases to respond because they cannot follow the perturbation. They, they, they cannot follow the perturbation at high frequency. They cannot catch up that vibration. What does that mean? That means the screening effect is only localized at really low energy. Okay? It doesn't, does not extend to all frequency. So this is a whole picture <coughs> of the screening of the dielectric function for, for 2D materials. For the intrinsic case, we only have interband plasma, which is at high energy, 10 eV or so, because the electron have to get across the band gap to create a plasma. But in the doping case, this, the 2D plasma effect kicks in, and it only localizes at low frequency in the long range limit according to the calculation. To do this calculation using the traditional GW method is challenging because you usually need to use a very dense K-grid, uh, do the full frequency calculation on the 2D plane. And if you are doing the calculation for dielectric function, you need lots and lots of constant wave function. And that's very expensive. In order to tackle this problem, I developed a, a number of numerical techniques to treat the situation of doping. The first one, the most important one, is called the double plasma pole model. I use one plasma pole to capture the intrinsic plasma, and the other plasma pole to capture the doping plasma. And on the top of that, I also do extrapolation of frequency domain, and then hybrid k-point sampling scheme. And it turns out the calculation by using when when I use this technique, I can get a 1,000 times the speed up compared to the traditional GW calculation. So after I consider all of those physical effects. Here's the change of the band gap. The band gap does not change abruptly. That lives up to our physics common sense. However, the band gap changes dramatically even at a not so high doping level. If I want to remember one thing from my talk, so please remember this. The band gap of a two-dimensional materials is highly tillable when you dope it. The band gap can change easily. 
at equivalent open level, if I, if I consider equivalent open level in here, the change of the band gap in silicon is just 80 million EV, five times weaker in silicon. The band gap can change so dramatically is because of the, the, <coughs> the uh, reduced dimensionality of the 2D materials. The density of state just increases like a step, which is suddenly introduce a larger screening that reduces the many body interaction. There are two very important physical outcomes for this bank up narrowing. According to my calculation, the bank up narrowing this way. The conduction band getting pushed down and the valence band getting pushed up. The first thing is the negative electron compressibility which means the more electron you put into the system, the smaller the Fermi level is. Because in this situation, many, the change in many body interaction overwhelm the, the increase of the Fermi level. So the bank of shrinkage is actually larger than the increase of Fermi level. Now this is total counterintuitive if you think about free electron gas. The more electron you put into a free electron gas, the larger the Fermi surface should be. The second thing is even more exciting we got a push up of the, our valence band. And the valence band is featured by spin optic coupling. If this band can push up, we have an enlarged spin optic coupling. And spin optic coupling is an important resource to realize the topological insulator, which means I can use a doping to tilt the robustly of a, of a topological insulator. And what's the end? Okay. Okay, the doping density is above 10 to the 13 per centimeter square. Carrier, okay, that's that. 10 to the 13, yeah. It's not so high, it's right. yeah. It's not so high, yeah. It's not 10 to the 15 that you actually like <laughs> explore your material. <laughs> okay, so what, what's even more exciting is that some guys just did experiment later using the photo emission and they confirm the true prediction using their measurement. You can see the, the, the narrowing of the band gap, the, the downshift, the conduction band, and also the increase of the spin optic coupling. So far we are talking about one particle excitation, the quasi-particle excitation. Now I'm gonna talk about two particle, electron hole coupling. This is the uh, standard electron hole pair picture. We call that as an aceton. It's important for lots of uh, optical uh, applications, such as a solar cell, light emit diode, and photocatalyst. When the sun hits the solar shell, has hit the solar cell, the first thing this energy will be converted is the exciton, then to electricity or any other uh, energy, any other form of energy. Okay, so understand exciton is important for engineer the optical property of these materials. Okay. The equation of motion of electron hole pair is called the beta Peter equation. It is also, also borrowed from high energy physics. That takes into account electron and positron coupling. In this context, we look at electron hole coupling. EC and EV are the respective equation of motion of electron and hole quasi particle, and K is their effective potential. K in, contains two terms. One is the direct term electron hole constantly attracted to hole. The other is the so-called exchange term. Electron will combine with hole while current interaction and then give rise to another electron and hole pair. Now this is just two second order diagram. If you ex actually define this diagram can go on to infinity and this become a ladder and that one become a string of sausage. You can imagine that. The BSC is quite complicated for you to understand. But there is indeed a very simple picture, hydrogen model. In a standard a semiconductor with a direct band gap, this BSC actually simplifies into a hydrogen model. Basically, it means electron orbiting around the hole is just like electron orbiting around the proton, okay? This is a pretty simple picture to understand exciton. However, Aceton can come in all sizes and shapes in 2D materials. For example, 
this is a general uh, result. The energy of this acetone are no longer degenerate for some of the 2P and 2S level. In hydrogen model, it that degenerate, but because of quantum confinement in two-dimensional materials, this degeneracy is lifted. Secondly, in an isotropic material like phosphorine, this acetone can get severely elongated, and the 2S orbital becomes something like that. In the so-called twisted bilayer graphene structure, quantum coherence effect is in. There's a two type of uh, acetone in here. They form an anti-bonding acetone and a bonding acetone. In the so-called anti-bonding acetone, there's a quantum that's a drop coherence effect, which should prevent the acetone to hybridize with any depopulation channel, leading to a so-called ghost acetone that's a, that, does, that doesn't seem to die away. And in the case of doping, the, the one as a spherical acetron just becoming into a serious ring because we weaken the electronal binding. If we calculate the optical activity of the all the acetron, calculate and, and plot them versus the energy, we will eventually get the optical absorption spectrum. That's the most important information about our, our materials. How strong does that absorb um, electromagnetic radiation? So here's one example, the intrinsic um, MOS2. You can see acetone manifests itself under the band gap, OK? Because the electron holes strongly bind together, this acetone emerge about 0.6 eV below the band gap. The reason is that the screening in the 2D material is reduced because this column might reach into the vacuum. We have an enhanced electron hole coupling in the 2D case. Now, using the model I proposed, the double plasma and pole model, I also find this acetone energy is highly tunable. In here, at a not so high doping uh, level, 10 to the 13, the band gap can actually merge with the acetone. So this means we can actually control the electron hole binding, control how we can separate the electron and hole and convert it into electricity. So far, I'm still considering. Um, so, so this result can be interfaced with the device application. If, if people are interested in uh, using these 2D materials, they can use this result to decide their acetonic devices. So just now, I was talking about Feynman diagram method. Here, we change the gear to talk about another something else, wave function. It was believed wave function is the best, um, sorry, it was believed Feynman diagram is the best method for excited state in solid. Here, I find something different. I find wave function is actually a better method to calculate X-ray spectroscopy in a, t in a very efficient manner, and it captures more physics than just, the, than just a Feynman diagram method. Here's the motivation of X-ray spectroscopy. The X-ray is produced by the so-called advanced light source. That's the major facility in Lawrence Berkeley lab. So it is sitting on the Berkeley Hill. You can see San Francisco is in the background, and that's the Golden Gate Bridge. Electron is being accelerated to the limit speed of light under this dome and produce X-ray of very high brilliance. We then use the X-ray to do research in chemistry, physics, and material science, and producing more than 800 free publication each year. What X-ray is, ex is exciting is the core electron, no longer the valence electron. Okay, so the core level of different elements are actually quite separated. If you look at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, three adjacent elements, the one S orbital are actually well separated by 100 electron volt. What does that mean? It means if you want to look at a specific, the chemical context of a specific element, you can just tune the X-ray to, to the energy and not look at what's going on of the absorption spectrum there. When the, when, when the X-ray does not have enough energy to escape from the core hole, it will actually orbiting around the core hole. So what X-ray is probing is like, it's a local structural and electronic information, such as chemical bonding, coordination number, and local electron-electron correlation and so forth. 
these are a few application I I I done with my co collaborator. We can use X-ray to study rechargeable battery cathode. Now the rechargeable battery is actually at the back of a cell phone, and that's the materials. The electron just the, the ion is just moving around crazily in the in the in the cathode, and then the transition metal ion can also move. Now this is a structure that does not have a long range order. You cannot use X-ray diffraction to actually probe the long the long range um, pattern. In this case situation, X-ray absorption X-ray absorption spectrum is very powerful for looking at the local geometry to understand why the ion gets stuck somewhere and to explain why our battery fail at a particular voltage. The other example also include liquid, like water, liquid solid interface, photo water prof sky, water or station system, and so forth. The what you are seeing in the X-ray spectroscopy is just this, X-ray absorption spectrum. It does not actually tell you the structure directly from that measurement. And first principle calculation is the key to relate the two pictures. First, we can use density functional theory, which is well established, to predict, this, to predict the structural stability and dynamic. So when we have a clear idea about a structure, we can use a first principle theory of X-ray spectrum to simulate the X-ray uh, for a given structure and then compare with experiment. The first part is well established, but the second part, there are many open questions because it's an exciting state problem, a many body problem, which is more complex than the ground state. So let's review uh, like, uh, the theory, the old theory we've been using for quite a while. Fermi's golden rule, two many body wave functions sandwich in a dipole operator. In principle, the two wave function, they should be a many body wave function. However, for extended system, like solid, liquid, this wave function, they're just too complicated and no one have a clear, clear idea about what this wave function looks like. As a trade-off, we use one body wave function. The initial state wave function here, outlined by red, it's taken from the so-called initial state system. That's just the pristine system. We take that from the core level of that system, okay? And for the, for the, for the final state single particle orbital, we take that from a final state system. And the final state system is something like this. We excite the, the one of the atoms. We create a core hole here. Because it's, it is immobile, we can use a charged atom to simulate the coho effect. We put the impurity atom in a super cell to simulate the X-ray attraction. Then this would be our, the, the, the orbital for the final state, okay? We use this so-called one body theory to find the transition amplitude. This theory has been so successful for, it's very successful uh, for about one or two decades when we study many organic materials, okay? However, Recently, when we turn to transition metal oxide, we run into a big problem. So this is the uh, absorption spectrum of oxygen. We excite the oxygen 1s orbital. It hops to 2p level because that's allowed by dipole transition rule. And because the oxygen 2p is a strongly hybridized with metal 3d. So what we are seeing in the experiment, the 2 peak here is actually reflecting the metal 3d level. From those of you from solid state physics, you can, you can call that this is the T2G and EG level, the gas split in the octahedral crystal field. And you can see the, their signature in the optical assumption. And, they want to, and we want to simulate them right. Because lots of time, our, our conclusion is draw based on the peak intensity ratio. The peak intensity ratio for IT2G and IEG. For example, in the rechargeable Ca uh, battery cathode. This intensity ratio tells us something about the lithium level, how much lithium actually get inside the rechargeable battery. And we, if we get this wrong, we have a totally wrong idea about how does our battery work, okay? And now the one body theory is total, give a total embarrassing result. In, in the chromium dioxide, you can see in the experiment, there was a really sharp peak there. However, in the one-body simulation, 
this pig almost disappear. And that's the theory, theory I want to correct. So talking about edge singularity, one thing I cannot mention is the theory from Anderson. He studied this about a half a century ago. What he's studying is such a situation. Let's try and guess. That is suddenly perturbed by a potential. Because all of these electrons can see the effect of potential, their wave function will ch just change it slightly. However, in a large electron limit, if this change in one body orbital accumulated, the many body wave function will actually have very small overlap with the initial state. So I actually predict an X ray spectrum light like this. The spectrum actually converge to the vessel because of the reduction in many body wave function. Okay? So this, that's a similar situation to the problem I'm looking at. And in this uh, situation, he was using Slater determinant. So just totally out of curiosity, I want to, to use a sl Slater determinant to solve my problem. OK. In Anderson's time, he did not have a physical computer. He did not know about DFT. And we do have all of this element today. Okay, here I made one very aggressive assumption. The many body wave function I use here, I use a single Slater determinant to approximate it. Okay, for some of the Grouse DFT, I use the Slater determinant uh, comprises all of the occupy occupy in here. I do the same thing for the final state orbital. Okay, there are then principle many many final state. We'll think about all possibility of excitation, okay? There could be many of them. And now, when we introduce the core hole, we are also introducing a rotation of the basic set. So this orbital are no longer in the same basic set as those one. And the, and, and the theta you're seeing here is a transformation between the two. So when I use the Slater determinant to approximate the transition amplitude, to approximate the wave function, the transition amplitude also become a determinant form. And the orbital overlap, the one body, one, one body orbital overlap is taken from the so-called DFT plus U calculation. So this, this theory takes into account some of the correlation effect in the 3D level, just perturbatively, OK? If I ever use this approximation, it turns out to be pretty successful for predicting the linear edge light shape. I would like to first talk about point to the case of chromium dioxide. The top one, experiment. The blue one, the one body theory. If I were to use the determinant method, this light shape just gets ratified, okay? This also apply to other transition metal. The peak intensity ratio just got corrected systematically. So how do I see that? I'm sorry, do I see it so, so my theory is here. An experiment is like that. Do you see the comparison? It's still below, but it's still below. Oh, there's an offset. Offset. I offset the spectrum when I plot it. Okay. So the baseline is actually it should be lined up with there. Yeah. Okay. They should have the same baseline just for visualization. I offset. Okay. Just so you understand, <coughs> we are not underestimating that shape. Okay. 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 So the short answer for why this theory would work this is because it it consider more many body process compared with a one body theory. The determinant approach, I just claim this without, without proof, okay? This is too, too technical. Determinant approach is equivalent to the so-called MND theory. And the MND theory included set of um, Feynman diagram. Beyond the BSC diagram, the, the red diagram and the exchange diagram in BSC, it also considered the bubble diagram that takes into account of orthogonality catastrophe considered by Anderson. And the six process considered by Mahan that, that, that account for the power law singularity of the X-ray edge. And in fact, th these are just two at uh, the second order that Feynman diagram. And in fact, this diagram can get very complicated. And you can even draw your favorite picture using some of the Feynman, Feynman diagram for some of the Russian castle. Okay, it can get very complicated. After I consider all this effect using the determinant approach, indeed, I get a better simulation result. Now in here, the determinant spectrum make a better comparison with experiment compared to this 
like if it's BSC calculation, you can see we get a better intensity ratio. So why this wave function method would work? Still, I will focus on the sample of a Taylor expansion. Now let's say this is your undergrad course, and you are asked to calculate something like this. Sine of xf minus sine of xi. xi is somewhere close to zero, and xf is somewhere above 2 pi. If you were to use the Taylor expansion to calculate this guy, that's not a big problem because it's close to zero. But if you were using Taylor expansion to calculate that guy, you run into a big trouble. You will need a polynomial about the order of 17 in order to get convergence to the value there, somewhere above 2 pi. Okay, that's very complicated. Instead, you can do something smartly. Okay, you can make expansion of xf around 2 pi instead of 0. Okay. Sine of 2 pi is something easy to calculate, that's zero. If you make expansion around 2 pi, you can just skip the painful process from zero to 2 pi. You can skip all of this perturbation term and get a very simple to answer. This is how the determinant method would work. Instead of one DFT, I have two. Initial state DFT without the excitation, final state DFT with the coho excitation, and I should mention the coho excitation is a strong perturbation to the system because it's so localized on one atom. The charge just get localized and it's just strongly perturbed the chemical contents of the X-ray excited atom. If I were to use a 2DFT, I can just skip all of this diagram and then give a very lit, simple answer to the X-ray spectroscopy. Now, the last question, a question that's often asked by my peer, peer quantum chemists or peer uh, computational condensed matter physics, is that now you introduce the determinant method and there are so many configurations in the final state space. Now you can think about the final state in this picture. In the single case, we, we have one electron hole. The double base, we have a two electron hole. The triple base, we have three. There are so many of them. And if you have 1,000 electron, this configuration space, just grow exponentially. How can you deal with this larger number? Okay, so here comes the curse of Feynman, that the Hilbert space is so damn big and, and have, have solved that problem. And algorithm I'm using is not too crazy different from the uh, algorithm Google Map used to find a pathway. It's called, it's called a breath first search. So let's say if we want to go to a favorite place for a road trip, for example, if you guys want to go to Yosemite, you ask Google Maps to search for the pathway. And that's the algorithm would be used by the Google app. So instead, going all the way towards the destination. Now, I hope you understand the cell phone does not understand direction. It only understands connectivity of the graph. It does not go all the way to the end, because this will cause a problem because you may probably go to New York if you, you are in the wrong di direction instead of Yosemite, okay? How, how does that, how does, is this a problem solved by breath first search? If first, just look at the city nearby. For example, you look at Kansas City or, or, or Denver or in Colorado, you just search the uh, nearest city, the first shell, the closest labor, which is a simpler task to, to, to do because it's easy to figure out the question if the path is shorter. When we get the information of those cities, we're gradually propagating our boundary of knowledge larger, larger, and larger. Okay? So this way, we will not go into the dead end and, and exponentially a lot of poss possibility. And that's the idea I'm using here. Okay? In fact, the configuration we are, we, I, I was showing actually developed this hierarchical structure. You can consider the ground state as a seed. It produces lots of children's state, single, single configuration, double occupation, and triple. Now the triple space is actually pretty large, okay? And I don't want to visit all of them because not all of them will contribute to our X-ray spectrum, okay? I don't wish, want to visit all of them. And another thing you notice that there are actually different pathways to get to a configuration. For some of this double configuration, you can first excite the electron to that position or to that position. 
and then comes the second electronal pair. There are two pathways. So I actually find in calculation, in many situations, the two pathways actually destructively uh, interfere with each other, with each other, leading to a very small amplitude. In this case, I can just remove that configuration before it gives rise to more configuration. So it turns out this search algorithm is very efficient to reduce our many body space. But the double space can be reduced by 100 fold and only maybe 0.1% of the triple space will matter when calculate spectrum. So that means I can reduce my final state configura configuration by many, many, many fold. So, this pro yeah, so ultimately, the computational cost of this method is just comparable to a one-body theory, just like DFT. How can we be that lucky all the time? That because that's X-ray spectroscopy. A local excitation. Okay. Not, not, I'm, I'm lucky there's some insight behind that's X ray, the nature of X ray excitation. We perturb locally the system. And then when those electrons scream the Coulomb direction, the electron far away cannot see the effect of the electron again. But I, but I hope to extend this search algorithm to valence excitation, to more complicated excitation, like solving this strong correlation problem. And that's the last slide I want to talk about. Wave function method. The lesson I learned from this calculation is that wave function method, many, wave, many body wave function method, sometimes this is not a bad idea for solid. And in fact, it could be a good idea. Okay? In the so -called, this actually coincides with the idea discovered in the density matrix renormalization group theory. What, um, what this theory implies is that the wave function actually has a specific form. The wave function coefficient is actually a product of a matrix, okay? Just like doing the multi matrix multiplication, okay, of a number of matrices of a finite size. The matrix will not be too large, okay? We can get the wave function coefficient for the one-dimensional Hubble model and Heisenberg model. Those are the standard strongly correlated system. And the wave function has an exact form. And that form can be expressed in terms of the so-called tensor level representation. If I were to use like a, a graphical representation of this product, I can use a latex, OK? Each pair here represents a matrix. And each bond between the two pairs means the contraction of the index, just like a matrix multiply, multiplication, OK? Summing over the, the, the indices, OK? And each outgoing uh, 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 a bond means the physical uh, state. You, you may think about qubit if you are in the uh, field of quantum information. You will consider as the uh, quantum state, spin up or spin down state of the one this spin train. The, if I were to use the, uh, the same representation to the call problem, it actually looks like this way. All orbital entangled with the call hole. Pretty simple picture because I'm using Slater determinant. And if the system is under critical transition, for example, if one uh, getting across, uh, like a, uh, a thermal, getting across a curvy temperature, entanglement will build up in a long range. And you can see this level begin to grow a lot. And if the system is periodic, you can just route, you can just um, roll it up. In this picture, you can see the tensor density is denser in some places compared to elsewhere. And then we can use some Riemann geometry to describe this tensor distribution. The most remarkable thing found in the last 20 decades is that this geometry actually coincides with the geometry near the wormhole. The wormhole is read by a black hole. So I think this is a good point to stop. I will talk about more of this research in tomorrow's research seminar, okay? Talk, talk about more about the technical detail. A very important lesson I learned is that we can end up with economy wave function approximation. Okay, so I would like to acknowledge the support from my previous advisor, Leon, and my current advisor, David Pennegras. They gave me lots of encouragement and support in my research. And some very cool experimental collaborator who actually come back to me, saying to me, hey, you found your theory is right. We see what you predict in experiment, 
And the X-ray, X-ray spectroscopy world is motivated by lots of these excellent collaborators across the whole United States. So thank you for your attention, and hope you like my talk. Increase the plasma energy because it's gradually transitioning to a bulk. Right. Yeah. So is that really monotonic? Mm, not necessarily. I think it's monotonic if you keep increasing a layer, it gradually transitions to a bulk. And then in the, in that in that sense you can you can imagine the, the plasma become a bulk like vibration instead of like a 2D like behavior. And another thing I want to comment on is that besides plasma, I guess it might also interest in band gap, maybe just like from what I have heard from you. If you were talking about the layer dependence of a band gap, in the case of phosphorine, the band gap of a bulk of a bulk phosphorus is actually quite small because of the electron scaling effect. The point something EV, I, I don't remember the number. But if you go to single layer phosphorine, the band gap is actually above one EV. It's actually quite close to two EV. Your calculation shows this monotonic kind of drop of the band gap. Right? Oh, that's with doping. If you, you are just talking <coughs> about intrinsic materials, yeah. If you introduce doping, the band gap will always drop, but it drops to a different degree in 3D compared to 2D system, different degree of shrinkage. So you see the band gap increasing with the doping, mm-hmm. right? But if you look at the exoplanet band gap, then I saw another effect, which is like the electron force. I mean, binding energy also reducing. Reducing, yeah, exactly. So then, if you look at the optical transition, right? Mm-hmm. So at the quantum mm-hmm. layer, so I mean, can you comment like with that? Be like increase or decrease? Okay, there are two stage. Okay, first, when you do the six-com, because the band gap shrinkage shrinkage effect yeah. is a dom- dominant. The, the uh, optical band gap is actually dropping, okay? However, if you have enough carrier, filling of the conduction band, it actually goes back. You can see it at a high open level, this absorption spectrum just goes up. I haven't shown you anything in between, I just do a truncation of the publication. You can see such a trend going down and then going up here. So let's uh, thank our speaker again.